Hey, we've got a great one for you today. Somebody who moved from marketing into sales. And we're going to talk about that journey, but also how she became very effective, really good. And now she's selling a new product into a new market space. <clears throat> I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. Uh, the guest has come up with a, a three-part framework for her model of sales, much more internal versus external, how she thinks, how she goes about it. I'll sum it up at the end, but I think you're really going to enjoy this. Uh, before we get into it, hey, if you see my content go by on LinkedIn, could you just say hi? Put a little comment in the uh, post, say, hey, I listened to the podcast, I'd appreciate that. If you can't do that, a little thumbs up, just hit a thumbs up, or maybe share it, something like that. Be a little social, would appreciate it. Also, <clears throat> check out our friends over at CoVideo. Uh, they're crushing it this year. Uh, video emails, one of those ways of staying engaged with your client. Uh, I, I kind of recommend it as a second uh, part of your process. The first part might show too much effort, but you you try it, see what works for you. Uh, but video is one of the things that uh, is coming out of the course as a great way of communicating with people in our space. Not the only way, but one one great way. Also, if you're in the courses, make sure you're checking out the office hours and the one-on-ones. I post them uh, as soon as I finish them in the course. Office hours is the second to the last chapter, and the one-on-ones are at the very last chapter. It gives you a good conversational sense of a deal. We had a great one yesterday, and I think uh, a lot of people got a lot out of it as far as you know how to win back deals and how to prevent your competitors from trying to ruin your deal you think they're going to do that well you better be ruining your competitors deals so whoever does it the best tends to win and these deals seem really solid until that last stage let's get into the interview and i'll sum it up at the end hey sarah welcome to the show as a way of getting started give us a little background on yourself Oh my goodness. Yes. Sarah Crow. Um, I work in healthcare technologies, um, selling, selling to health IT um, into large health systems. I live in Bozeman, Montana. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the benefits of, of COVID, I guess, is that we're all digital now. So really the opportunity to do what I love to do in a place that's beautiful, beautiful and snowy. Right yeah. <laughs> you thought you'd have to move, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And why sales? Looks like you studied marketing. and Yes, um, completely by accident, um, by chance, honestly, um, like, like you said. It wasn't well thought out. <laughs> it, it wasn't. It wasn't at all. Um, I started in marketing, in PR, I were advertising agencies. Um, and then it was, it was, it was by chance. I was working at an organization. One of the top salespeople left um, and they needed somebody to kind of fill in. And so I started dabbling and fell in love um, yeah. and I don't, I'll never go back. What'd you like about it? You know, there's something that is like so intriguing and the relationships and the, the, um, you never know what your day is going to be, right? There's nothing that is the same. It is just, it's exciting. Um, and that chase I love. Um, and so, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a good of, space. I mean, because it's almost the opposite of marketing a lot of ways, because marketing, you do a lot of things and you're not really sure what's working. <laughs> <laughs> well, and in theory, marketing is driving sales, right? That's that's the whole point. Hopefully, yeah. Ideally, right? And so to actually be on the forefront, to be kind of, you know, that almost gatekeeper into an organization where you're, you know, earning this trust. Um, it, it's, I love it. I just, yeah. I love it. Yeah. So the first year, was it awkward? Or was it a big adjustment? It honestly wasn't. No. <laughs> uh, no. You're it natural? wasn't. I think that, you know, my husband is, is in sales. And okay. so I saw him. Yeah, you get a sense a of what it was all about. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, being relational is very important to me. And I'm more of, you know, there's definitely different kinds of sellers and I'm much more of a relational seller. And so I was able to kind of 
And, and that's one of the things that I like about it too, instead of kind of thinking about the organization with marketing and how you kind of drive the perception externally with sales, I get to speak with so many different people and understand their problems and how we can provide value that I really love that side of it. Yeah. Because it's, it's not academic. It's like, you know, feed on the street, you know, literally the, you're the front soldiers. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And did you miss marketing at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> Is that bad? Um, no, I mean, I still help with marketing in, in my current organization where I can. There's still that side of me that does, yeah. you know, lo love um, a lot of what marketing has to offer. But I, I, I'm in the right space for me. And how about as far as like the, the rejection and the ups and the downs? Marketing is much more kind of a flywheel, campaign oriented, calendar oriented. Yeah. Well, hearing no is definitely not something that I like. <laughs> Let, <laughs> let's be honest. Yeah. Um, but I have three sons and I, I don't know. I, um, it doesn't you bother me. You say no a lot then. <laughs> I say no a lot. Uh, I'm used to that. But also, I think that there's, when you hear, hearing no is not always a bad thing. Right. Oftentimes when you're on the phone, when you're hearing no, it's not no to you. It's no, I don't have the time. Yeah. No, I don't have the bandwidth. And those are solute, you know, I can come up with solutions to those no's. So I don't always see no as being a bad thing. And I you know, sometimes it's an opportunity. Yeah. So uh so the rejection, yes. Sometimes there's the hard rejection that I you can't work around, and that's not fun, but you get back on your feet. And, and you move forward. Yeah. And how about as far as like the control over your income? Was that a big plus for you? I, I mean, absolutely. Right. I mean, that's, that's sales. You know, you, you go into these organizations and gosh, I remember um, in marketing at one of the first companies and I'm watching these salespeople crush it. Right. And part of me was like, why? Why are you like, why are you guys making so much money? Like we're helping you. Right. We're providing you with content. <laughs> we got we're you the leads. Yes, exactly. All you we're, had to do was take the order. Yes. And then as soon as I got a sales, I'm like, got it. This is so <laughs> hard. It, you're traveling all the time. The relationship aspect is so it's because it's different every day because yeah. you're working with people externally. It just changes the dynamics so much. And you have to be good at what you do to succeed. Right. There's no just kind of a desk job where every day I'm kind of just, you know, creating content. And I am, I have to be good for my company to succeed. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm out. So there's definitely that benefit. How about like what I noticed, like I went from engineering to pre-sales to sales and how you got treated was night and day uh -huh. as, a, as an engineer and a pre-sales, you got treated great. <laughs> then you all of a sudden you're working for the same person and you're not getting the love and feeling anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's that's so interesting that you say that. I think that there's, um, there's definitely a stigma, right. To the sales title, right. Yeah. Like when I lead, when I go into conversations, um, you know, it's people are introducing themselves and giving their titles. And I'm always like, I'm the sidekick. I'm the relationship person. I never lead with a title because I think immediately people have this intrinsic reaction. That's like, Oh, they're trying to push something on me that I don't need, or I don't want. Right. Instead of me earning that trust first. Um, so there's absolutely that. I have to say though, the organization that I'm working with now is sales forward. So we, as a sales organization get treated, um, wonderfully. So I have to say there's that we're, I'm in the right spot. Yeah. And what causes that? Is it uh, founded by a salesperson or led by someone who came out of what, sales? One of the founders is a salesperson. Yeah. One is an engineer product, you know? Um, so, so there is definitely one was more of a consultant. So the relational aspect is understood and how important that is to drive growth. And that is critical for salespeople and, and a lot of companies I've been in companies where it was like uh, salespeople were the necessary evil. Yeah. Didn't get equity. Only the engineers got equity. You get commission, you don't get equity. And you're like, you know, who's out there 
creating a market for your product. Well, and outside of that, you know, the, the coolest part about being in sales is that I can see a direct impact in yes. what the company's valuation is, right? For every, you know, if, if, if we're kind of thinking about, you know, a 10X on SaaS, right, from a valuation standpoint, I can see, you know, every $100,000 that I bring in is another million to you. What does that that. mean? Right. So that I love seeing that too. Like, how can I help drive that growth of the organization and, and the value? Yeah. I had that conversation with a CEO early in my career. We had just closed a big deal and he goes, you're going to make more than me this year. I go, (laughs) yeah, maybe W2, but not on top line. Exactly. And I had to explain it to him. And he was like, oh, I guess. (laughs) You're like, wait a second. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, this is a car to me, but it's a house to you. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. So the, I, I love being able to see that, right? Because yes, there's the deals that you bring in and you can see that ARR, which is wonderful. But if you actually take a bigger picture, look at what that means to the organization, what that means to the market, um, that that's impactful. You mentioned trust. How do you build trust? What's, do you have a particular process or style? You know, I think that this does come with um, the relational aspect to how I sell. I kind of, I kind of look at selling and why I believe that I'm a great seller, kind of three different aspects, two points, and then something that kind of ties it all together. So the first is passion. I mean, of course, you're going to hear that from sellers, right? The first is passion, but but it's passion for what though? <laughs> exactly. So it's not just passion for selling; it's passion for what you're selling. Yeah. It's passion for what you do, right? Like right now, I have this distinct opportunity to work for an organization where I believe in the mission and vision. I believe in the leadership. I believe in the products that we're selling, and the value that it brings. Right. So I'm just very, you can tell when a seller doesn't believe in what they do. Like maybe, maybe it's an easy sell, you know, maybe, maybe every organization needs it, you know, and it's like, okay, I'm just doing what I have to do. Checking boxes. I, I truly, you know, I I have the passion for what I do. So I think there's that side of it and that helps drive the trust. Right. But then the other, Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then the other point would be empathy, right? Like I, I want to understand who I'm speaking to. I want to be able to solve their problems. I want to be curious about those problems, right? I want to, you know, how, how can we, you know, make that better? How can the flexibility of my platform make it so that you are better at your job so that your boss looks at you and says, you did this right. Right. How can I build that trust with, you know, that passion and with that empathy? I think that those are kind of two of the biggest pieces to drive the trust. And then that's, that's from the prospect driving trust within the organization is that, you know, it ties both of those together for me is I can always be better. You You know, that, that's something that like, as soon as the sale is done, there's another one. Right. And I can continue that relationship because it's important. And that's how I am this relational person. But I think that I can always improve. I can always be learning and every deal will help kind of drive insight towards the next one. I I think that's a great mindset, that growth mindset. And how can I become better, which has the assumption I'm not perfect. Yes. Far from it. (laughs) Right. right? (laughs) Because the question I always asked myself about a deal is what don't I know, which assumed I didn't know at all. Exactly. Which spurs that curiosity. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because we can't know it all. Right. I mean, we can, we can always try to put, you know, the shoes on of the prospect, but we don't know what's happening internally. You know, we can get to the table and suddenly something drops and, you know, you, you've got your point of contact and you understand the path and the process and, you know, what it typically takes to get something to the finish line from their organization. You drill into those to understand so that you don't have that many obstacles, but every organization is different. So, and and we're assuming that they even know. Exactly. And our jobs to, to kind of walk them through that process to have them think about the alternatives because they're probably not doing that. Mm-hmm. 
they give you some feedback, they tell you what they like, they tell you what they don't like. But how does it compare to doing nothing? How you're doing it today? How you're doing it a different way? Yeah, well, let's dig into that. Well, and I think that that's also why right now we've all had this big shock with COVID. Yeah. Um, and we've all had to learn that something can drop in a second, right? So we need to be able to adjust to that. Yeah. Right? We have to be able to kind of understand that things aren't always going to be the same. Budgets aren't always going to be the same. Suddenly, you know, I mean, I'm working with health systems. They were closed for months, you know, so it, it's um, understanding that the change happens and how you navigate around that and how you adjust whether that's the organization that I'm selling to or my organization, that's very, very important to kind of, if you can see around the corners as much as possible, um, that's, that's where you can succeed. Yeah. And that's hard. And we, we try and think that we can predict everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're in sales, right. Brian. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's hard. And how did you come up with those three elements? Was this kind of a, a reflective process? Did you notice yeah. it in other people? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, you know, as you kind of grow in your career and you have people who come and ask for advice or, you know, even speaking with my husband, looking at what he does and, you know, kind of self-reflection is very important. You know, why, why didn't I do a good job here? How could have I improved? Um, and then kind of, why, why am I, why am I so passionate about what I do? You know, there's kind of these different aspects you, you know, for me, health IT, I had brain surgery three years ago oh, so and it's personal, it's personal. Yeah. and you know, we're all patients at some point. And so some I, have, <laughs> at some point we are right. Um, and so I do have this, this piece that's driving that. Right. And that's, that's kind of the easy piece with the passion. Yeah. that I, that I've found. And then the empathy is really the, you know, being relational. And then, I mean, the, the can always be better is just who I am. I'm just competitive. Yeah. It, it just, that's well, part of me. Where's that come from? I was the third born. There you um, go. I a third of third, third. Um, I had a brother and then a sister and um, I love sports played yeah. sports my whole yeah. life. Um, and I like winning. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like being told no. Um, but to win, you have to be strategic. You know, you have to kind of think again, see around corners. You have to think about things and you have to think about somebody else. That's where I think a lot of salespeople miss. That's natural. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because that, that empathy, you know, what, what I've kind of learned is that the deepest part of the most effective part is this thing called theory of mind it's your ability to see the world the way the other person sees it yeah and as a mother you've probably seen this with kids it's like they if they cover their eyes they think you can't see them uh-huh <laughs> Just because they can't see you. Hey, yeah. <laughs> yes, that makes sense. Right. And this is kind of like one of the more advanced things that nobody talks about. And I always used to ask my reps, like, if you were them, what would you do and why? Yes. And, and, and they get, and I put them into a trance. They, they couldn't, it was like I spoke uh, Swahili to them. Yeah, well, and that's one thing that, you know, I sat down with a, a lot of our SDRs the other day and because I got an email from, from one of them, you know, an example email and I responded and I said, would you respond to this? Well, uh, maybe not. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, so that's, a, that's the thing that we always need to focus on and that we as humans innately, I mean, what do we, I mean, even right now, Brian, what do we as humans love to talk about? ourselves. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that hasn't changed. That and it won't change, It'll right? We change. we we all have some narcissist in us. We love to talk about ourselves. So I'm like in order to have a conversation with someone, sending out a blanket email, I mean, I'm going to ignore that all day long. You research that person. You tell them how amazing they are. You understand what they want. What will help them be better? You, I mean, you could send out a thousand emails a day, 
But if you send one, right? If you send one that you researched and you really got to know that person, that's when you're going to have a, a better response rate. Yeah. So that's what I try to teach is you've, you've got to, you've got to think about what is going, why would somebody respond to you? Right. Yes. Because they want, they want to hear about themselves. Talk about themselves. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> exactly. Not you and your product. Exactly. And exactly. what's every cold call sound like? This is who I am. This is what we do. This is why it's so incredibly crazy good. Me, 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 me. Yeah. And the other person's like, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know why I care. Can I exactly. please leave? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So if you can tie it back to, yes. you know, an article that you've read, a quote that you have, you know, you said this and it really resonated with me because of X, Y, Z. I think that you know, it really helps people. Again, this is part of that trust is, okay, this person took some time, right? Yeah. I've had in my career, I've had one SDR reach out to me, having looked at my LinkedIn. One. Yeah. And it's, you would think it's so obvious, but it's just the opposite. Yeah. Because I get pitched guests all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one person just put a review of the podcast. A five star took a picture of it and, and just said, I'm not sure if this person's a match or not. Could you tell me if they are or not? If they're not, why? It's a give. Yep. Right. And it's just not some blanket thing of yet another Amazon seller who just wants, you know, free PR. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's a mentality. If we can change that, and if we can change that early in careers. You know, if we can change that, that yeah. I think it's the hard part of it is, is innate to talk about ourselves, but, mm -hmm. but it's the same for the other person too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Can you change? Is it easy to change that? Oh, you know, I think you can change process, yeah. right? I think you can change process early in those when you are just kind of hustling, trying to get meetings and whatnot. I think you can change people's process and help them understand. It also has to come from leadership of these teams. Yes. You know, so often it has been numbers, 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 dials, dials, dials. If it's not quality, it doesn't matter. It doesn't you matter. Know? It, it doesn't it, matter. It's counter effective because people get burnt out. You know, if you have to do 50 dials, you can't do any research. You can't find out what the person cares about. Exactly. And well, and then managers were raised on this mentality. Yeah. Well, and then these organizations that you've been targeting become numb to you and numb to your That's brand. Right. Right. You only you only have so many opportunities to get that great first impression. Right. And so if you're constantly hitting people with things that is just not useful then suddenly the entire brand that comes with the next sales rep too is done to them. Yeah. You know, you, that, that opportunity needs to start earlier where you are engaging in a way that is productive. Um, and that pro again, provides value. Because so much of what we sell requires a conversation, not a pitch or not a commercial. Yep. Exactly. You know, I'm sure what you sell requires a conversation. <laughs> It absolutely does. Yeah, it absolutely does. It requires so many conversations. I mean, <laughs> I'm in healthcare. It's not like we're moving quickly over here. Um, so yes, I mean, getting that individual on the phone for the first time um, is, I mean, that that's the spot. That's that's the starting spot, and that is so vital to the process that we can't have so many misses before that happens. Even if you do suddenly get somebody on, they've already they already have a bad taste in their mouth. Yeah. So, and, and when they see your caller ID come up or your voicemail, do they want to listen to it? Exactly. Even if they don't have to. Yeah. Because they know you have their best interest in mind which is mm -hmm. trust. That's the trust. Yeah. Somebody can like me all day long. Right. But they're not good. Yes. You got to get to trust. You have to you have to earn that trust. You know, people can buy from a company, you know, maybe, but they're really and this is why I love selling because I am I feel like I'm that gatekeeper. You know, trust, integrity, honesty, that means a lot to me. 
you know, I want to, when I have these conversations with an organization and I'm speaking to what we can do to provide this value, we have to, as an organization, be able to support that yes. because I'm not gatekeeper to the trust of everything that's going to flow from, it's not just a deal, right? This is a partnership. These become people who then speak to other people. In my head, every single deal should turn into four or five partnerships, right? Because they should go out and they should tell other organizations. So that's, you know, that is so important to me. And that's why I love this kind of being at the forefront of saying, okay, you can trust me in this organization because this is the value that we provide. And we are going to make sure that we do provide that value. And give us a sense of what your company does and how complex it is for the customer to buy it and change it and implement it. Yeah. So we do an experience management platform, which is really real-time text messages. Okay. So, so we can, you know, think about consumers um, from every level, from the start to their interaction with your company to the finish. We can provide a lot of value as consumers. So why aren't organizations taking that feedback and making changes, right? Okay. So that's what we that's what that's what we sell is the ability for you as an organization to dig into these areas of unknown, to understand where, you know, gaps and expectations have been and then fill those gaps with quality process that you've defined with with that great sounds, data. That sounds like such an easy sale. Right? <laughs> Honestly, I mean, every organization needs it, you know? Right, but on their end, you know, saying it's a great idea is easy. Yes. Implementing it is it a, a journey. Is a journey, but it also, that the nice thing is the platform that I'm, is so flexible. So we can start with one use case, you know, one team that really is seeing an issue that want, they want to solve it. Let's start there. Right. And then the integration aspect is a very easy lift from an IT perspective. So that's yeah. not an obstacle that we have. So we can kind of get this data feed moving easily. So it really is if we can find that, you know, individual who has a problem and wants to figure out how to be better, that's where we succeed. And where do you start within an organization? Is there a particular persona that has this problem to solve? Oh, you know, it, it definitely depends on the organization on, you know, there's now there's experience um, yeah. teams, you know, within healthcare, there's experienced teams outside of healthcare, you know, most organizations the, from, you know, from hiring up is all about experience, right? Yeah. They have to focus on that. I mean, consumerism. So it just kind of depends, you know, there's um, chief experience officers, there's chief marketing officers who really need to help drive that brand awareness and that NPS um, yeah. operations, right? Ops wants to say, okay, I want to understand why we are, aren't getting a great score here. I want to understand why people aren't telling their friends to come here. Let's, let's figure out that process. So there's quite a few different personas that I can tackle, which is beneficial. Also, different, right? Selling to somebody in HR is going yeah, to be very, very different, different than yeah. selling to ops. Yeah. So th those are kind of two different mindsets that I have to go about when I'm having these conversations as well. And, and have you come up with like an asset test to differentiate people who are curious about it versus who have a real business interest in it? Oh my goodness. I mean, to qualify a conversation is... And, and that depends on the size of the organization too, right? I mean, you know, depending upon that size, how many obstacles you're going to hit along the way, how many people have to be in that room and who have to sign that line, right? So there's definitely, when I'm looking at the size of different organizations, who I'm able to get that conversation with to start, you know, what level they are, um, I, I, it, it, it definitely, it's all very variable, yeah. <laughs> if you will. And is it typically an event causes it or somebody's passionate about their NPS score or their reputation or their major <laughs> shareholder? Yeah. You know, I, usually when I'm targeting and, and reaching out to people, it's those people who are innovative, right? Those, those people who are willing to kind of take a, take a chance 
who want to do something different. Yeah. Um, there's those individuals, um, again, the experience, um, th- those people. But right now, right with COVID, there is this distinct opportunity for change, right? And there's this distinct opportunity for gaining brand loyalty. Everyone has been holed up for months, not shopping, maybe some online, not going out, not going to the doctor, right? So if I've gone to a couple different doctors, you know, an urgent care here, the health system down the street, I mean, when I have to go back, I'm most likely going to go back to somebody who's been engaging with me, asking how I'm doing, not waiting until after an encounter happens, but who's been letting me know the status of the world, you know, in the meantime. So right now in every vertical, definitely a distinct opportunity to build awareness, build loyalty by engaging with people throughout their entire life cycle with your organization. And I got to believe it's much stickier than email. Oh, oh my goodness, much stickier. And we all always have our cell phones in front of us, you know, unfortunately, but it's, it's the, the path of the world. I mean, I, I get emails all day long and it's just noise, you know, I'm not going to go and check out an email to, you know, fill out a survey. Exactly. And that's what this is, why it's beneficial. It's not just you know, a survey, it's prefer- like, help me define your preferences. So the next time you're here, I can manage around that. Yeah. I can define a process and an experience around what, what matters to you as a person. And then looking at the entire population of constituents, what yeah. matters most to them. So the, right now there's, um, you know, there's an opportunity for so many organizations to, instead of being passive, I think a lot of organizations pass, they watch social media to see if they have a bad review. They well, wait until somebody's in the store. Why aren't you engaging before? Right. Because by the time they go on to Google or Yelp, who goes on there? Either people who are really into reviews or people who are mad. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Revenge. Yes. And yes. don't have the guts to call the manager. Exactly. Just wants to put up like, I don't, I don't believe they did this to me. Yeah, I, so, I waited two and a half minutes to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> but yes, exactly. You, I mean, you're exactly right. Why are we waiting until somebody's mad? Why don't we help one, you know, define the process so that they aren't mad to yeah. begin with? But then, you know, even in the moment, why aren't we recovering that in real time? Yeah. Why aren't we giving them Fix an opportunity? It. Yes. So Before there's just... Goes- you know, completely yeah. off the rails. Yes. And, you know, so many of these organizations offer up some sort of a solution that is like, yeah. we can, we can make sure that we're asking people questions after, but that's too late. It's, it's too late. Right. It needs to be before, during and after. Yeah. Cool. This has been a great conversation. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Yes. On LinkedIn, Sarah C. Cat Crow. Um, my email, sarah.crow at feedtrail.com. Um, and yeah, I'd love to connect. And what's your territory in case somebody out there wants to buy your product? I am West coast, (laughs) Bozeman, Bozeman, Montana. I'm, I'm the West coast. How'd you like that three part model of sales, passion, empathy, and becoming better. I think it's a good start. Uh, you know, the, the challenge a lot of us have is, well, I'm not passionate about what I sell. Uh, But can you be passionate about the outcome that it provides either for you, your customer, or both, or your company? Probably. Um, You know, I don't think many of us were passionate at sales at first. Certainly not the the job itself, the rejection and everything, but we're passionate about the outcome that we can provide for ourselves. The empathy, I'm, I'm reading a book now on it, and you think that people are either empathetic or not. It's a learned skill like any other skill. You got to practice it. You got to look for ways of improving it. And the big thing I got out of that is the how to become better. If you have the how I can become better mindset, what am I missing? How could I have done a little bit better? It doesn't mean you did bad. It just means you can do better. 
And this is something that the great salespeople, great people at anything have that mindset. Because the moment you think you're good or great and don't need to improve, what happens? You kind of start rotting. You get stuck in that B-player trap. That's the definition of the B-player trap, is you've had some success, and now it's not working the way it used to. And a lot of us get real sensitive about that. But the best elicit it, want it crave it because if you have that craving of becoming better of analyzing what you've done you're going to get better that's how we practice at sales <clears throat> we think it's just doing role plays or practicing your presentation that's part of it sure but isn't it more your strategy and your mindset thinking like your client how do you become better at that uh, having, you know, counterparts, that's one of the things we're getting out of the office hours part of the course is I open it up. I don't try and be the, the shell answer man. I like to hear how other people would handle the particular situation and then how to prevent it in the future. We're all going to fall into these traps. The complex sale is complex. And a lot of people say, oh, people overcomplicate sales. Well, uh, maybe, <laughs> but you know, it's easy to take an order. It's hard to compete and win against, you know, fierce com competition, especially if, if we're in a market like that, where people, there's only a few players, everybody knows who they are, very similar. We've got to find the things that we have that they don't and manage to that, set expectations in our clients' minds. Because if we don't, the deal flip-flops. And I'm sure you've had deals like that. One day it's you, the next day it's someone else, and today it's you. And the only thing that matters is who is it the day they place the order. And in winning the complex sale, I, I show you a system to prevent this from happening, to try and have as much control as you can with an organization, guiding them through what they have to do, uh, preempting classic pitfalls, anticipating what your competitors are going to do and how you can set up traps for them instead of us falling into them. Nothing's foolproof. <laughs> it's a game <laughs> and we're, we're playing to win. So do you want to win or do you just want to wait and see, see how it plays out? In the complex sale, more than half of your deals are going to die to no decision, no action. Uh, putting it off or buying the minimum. That means six months of your year is wasted. Might as well go on vacation. At least you enjoy yourself. How can you get more of those deals to close? To be, come in at the real dollar amount you want them to, not get uh, minimized. That's what winning the complex sale is all about. And it's taught by somebody who's done it and continues to do it. My passion for winning was out of the, the time commitment that I made to these deals. And when you give up your weekends and your nights uh, to travel, to prepare, to lobby for the resources you need to close these deals, and you find out a competitor is going to take it away from you, not on my watch, my man. You, you have to have a system. You have to have a community that you can talk to. You, you can hear it out. And all the office hours, I record them all and put them back into the course, second to the last chapter. It's pure gold to hear other people talk about a particular issue. And when people are vulnerable, they share w what happened. And it's natural. It happens to the best of us. And the thing is, it happens more often than we anticipate, and usually at the worst possible time. And... Think of the money that you're missing out on those deals. Uh, makes the course look like uh, <laughs> nothing at all. We got to become better at sales. And it's something that never ends. And w sales is the type of profession, the more you get into it, the more you find out how deep it is. And that's a good thing. 
it means that you're much smarter than your competitor. A lot of people think it's just, you know, demo, propose, negotiate, close. Well, how's that working for you? And I I hear it all the time. I talk to VPs of sales all the time, the melting forecast. I used to build my whole business off of that one pain point with VPs of sales. I'd always call them the first or second week in the new quarter. And I knew the pain that they were in. Because no matter how good their quarter was, there was probably still 30% of the deals that were committed that didn't close. And they didn't know why. You know, the, oh, no decision, politics, uh, paperwork, snags, legal, all of these things. That's natural, but they can be prevented. Not all the time, but if you could just get another 10% of those deals in, that's life-changing revenue. That's life-changing income. And I'd rather have that income. (laughs) Oh, but Brian, you got to pay all that taxes. Okay, go to b2brevenue.com, sign up for winning the complex sale before it's too late. Now's the time. It's that time of year, folks. Also, how's the pipeline look? I'm telling you, the most powerful skill you can have, other than closing the deals, is starting them. And the pitch, can you really sell your product with a pitch? Is it like a Shark Tank type of thing where that what, five minutes they give the person to pitch the idea? You might have that type of product. Most of us don't, or at least not enough to differentiate ourselves, to both understand uh, the problem that we solve and how it's different and the payoff that you get. Uh, That's usually a conversation of quite a while and multiple steps. They have to get comfortable with it. They have to vet it. They have to test it out. They have to compare it. They have to justify it. All of those things take conversations. And how do you get people to want to talk with you? Not have to talk with you. That's a skill. Too many of us think it's a subject line or magic words. They're helpful. They're part of it. Uh, But to be the real magician, you have to practice it take feedback, take other examples, find just the right timing, much like in comedy. (laughs) Selling and communication is a performance. We we don't want to look at it that way because we want to think, oh, we either know it or don't know it. The most common question I get on LinkedIn is, any book recommendations? And it's like, okay, you, you can read all the books. That's usually the first step everybody does, especially In the 20s, if you look on YouTube, you know, pretty much all of the the personal development stuff is about reading books. Well, okay, knowledge is good, but it's only one part. It's like activity and sales. Activity is one element. Are you having the right activity with the right person at the right time in the right way? Uh, You got to put it all together. And how do you determine how to get better? You got to hear other people. You got to get feedback. You got to try different techniques. You have to share what you're doing and get feedback and want it. That's what start the conversation, get the meetings all about. Now think if you have this skill, the ability to start a conversation with a stranger, almost anybody you want, anybody who's reasonable, not everybody wants to talk. We've got entrepreneurs in the course that have never sold a day in their life, and they're crushing it. One of the most successful students, never been in sales, crushing it. Why? Because they're motive. They're motivated. When you're an entrepreneur, you have no base salary. And I always thought that, you know, the base salary is nice, but a base salary gets us a little too comfortable sometimes. Uh, when I first went out on my own, I was overconfident and I, I, had, I got humbled because I was selling to a persona I never talked to before. I knew what their pain was. I, I walked in their shoes before, but I never sold to them. And I had to develop that skill, which was kind of the impetus for this course. 
And once I got to know these VPs of sales, they go, well, we love the winning the complex sale, Brian, but, uh, you know, teach us how you got in here. Because I don't remember you cold calling or pitching me. And I, I'd take them through the journey that I, I used. And it took a while to develop. And it, it's been now seven years of it. And I've taught it in person. We, we do it live in the course the first day. I could, you know, pick somebody you really want to talk to. Doesn't matter how high up. And, you know, maybe celebrities are, aren't as accessible. But we would get conversations started with them about them. And to do that, it takes time. It takes practice. It takes feedback. It takes getting out of your comfort zone. Too many of us just want the magic subject line and the magic pitch and uh, send your calendar link and your PO and, and get an order. Well, it doesn't work that way. Anyways, check it out at b2brevenue.com. Check out the other podcasts, uh, Sales Questions, Brutally Honest Answers, uh, the B2B Revenue Leadership Show, and the Sales Leadership Show. What a lot of shows. But tell a friend about it, about the podcast. I'd appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Always looking for great guests, uh, trying to find the best salespeople in the world out there in the B2B space. Uh, If that's you or you know somebody, uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. Brian G. Burns on LinkedIn and love to get you on the calendar. We'll see you next time.